The word notion seems harmless enough, doesn't it? But we invest our deepest feelings in notions. In fact, I think a better word for notion would be fetish. Fetish is commonly understood in a sexual sense. For example, some people have a foot fetish. If you don't have a foot fetish, then this might seem quite amusing. But if you do have a foot fetish, then... Well, it's hard for me to say because I don't have a foot fetish. But it seems that people that have a foot fetish find the sight of a foot highly erotic. Intensely stimulating, even. The word fetish apparently comes from the Latin root to make. It therefore means artificial, which fits in with notions. We create our notions and we invest the deepest emotion in them, deeper than sex even. So I think a better word for notion is fetish. They are ideas that hang on, we hang on to. They are ideas that we seek gratification from. And this is the power of the, an idea. It's difficult to see how anybody can get sexual gratification from feet. Because feet cannot deliver the goods, ultimately. <laughs> but there is the, the feeling, there is the feeling on the part of the foot fetishist that the goods are being delivered, but they're obviously not. So this is the intensity of fetish. It operates at different levels, not just sexual levels. Apparently there's economic fetish. For example, there's the growth fetish. This is defined by Marxists. This is a political term, growth fetish, whereby we believe that all economical problems can be solved by continuous economic growth. It's a fetish that the world of economics is very much in the grip of. But this is an idea, and it's an idea which affects stock markets. If people perceive that an economy is not growing, then confidence goes. So it's all to do with perception. In fact, our economic reality is based on perception, it's based on notions. That's probably quite clear to most people. It's not how well a company is doing, it's how well it's perceived to be doing. So a notion is a fetish. That conveys the power that we need to deal with here. And if we can abandon our fetish, if we can see its nonsensical nature, if you're a foot fetishist, and you can then see what it's what this looks like from the point of view of a person who is not a foot fetishist, then you can see it's actually quite absurd. It's an absurd thing. I should say it's a very natural thing as well. It happens amongst animals. We see animals evolving in the most peculiar way based on their own fetishes. The peacock's an example of this. Oh, this has turned into something of, of beauty by chance. We've got this beautiful structure of the peacock's tails. And that would have been by following a fetish, a female following her fetish as far as the, the peacock's concerned. So it's a natural phenomenon. It's one that we are in the grip of. It's also an artificial phenomenon. It's something that we've constructed in our own heads. And it's one that we can free ourselves from. And once we've freed ourselves from it, we can rest in our own being. We're no longer agitated by the power of the fetish. If you rest peacefully in your own self, you'll know that in comparison, even the state of an emperor is like a blade of grass. A blade of grass gets blown this way and that way and eventually gets cut or eaten at some point. And this is how we are when we're caught up in the grip of our notions, of our fetishes. We're pulled this way and that. And certainly an emperor is going to be pulled in so many directions. 
that we've got the option of resting peacefully in our own self, in our own essential nature, complete, a sense of completeness coming from within and not from our fetishes. We're not going to get that sense of completeness from our fetishes. Following on from this, when you're resting in yourself, how do you actually then get on with your usual activities? When one has made up his mind to go to a certain place, his feet function without any mental activity. Function like those feet and perform action here. It's like driving a car. When you learn to drive a car, you have to give your complete attention to everything. This is why it's tricky because you have to do several things at the same time. With your hands, your feet, checking your mirrors and what's in front of you. But once you've learned to drive, you can quite happily engage in a conversation with somebody else. You can think about other things. And driving is a life and death activity. If you don't drive correctly, then you could easily die. You can kill others. But a good driver is somebody who can multitask, who can be thinking about other things and when necessary bring their attention right back to what they're doing in the car. But by and large they can just let the body get on with it. The body is fully engaged in the driving process while the mind can be elsewhere. And this is how it can be once you're resting in your own equanimity. We've learned the skills of living by now. We should be able to get on with life automatically while we keep ourselves centred. We become like the driver in the car. The driving is happening, but our mind is centred elsewhere. Act here after abandoning desire for reward or the fruits of actions without the motivation of pleasure or profit. Then the objects of the senses will be devoid of attraction, but will be what they are. Even when sensation of pleasure arises on contact with the objects, let it lead you inward to the self. So when something is tempting us, we allow it to remind us that we're not centered and we can take this as a reminder to come back to the self.